for welcoming the uh, the theme music was. It's me, Jamila Lemieux. This is the children. Uh, the kids are asleep, if you will. Uh, thank you for coming back and joining us once again. We were gone last week. We took a nice long break for the Labor Day holiday. I hope that your pandemic weekend was as enjoyable as possible and that you stayed inside so we can go outside at some point next year. I miss the streets and the streets miss me very badly. Um, so, we have a very exciting, uh, very special guest today. I won't uh, keep you waiting for him much longer. But before we get to him, um, I just wanna send my thoughts and prayers to all of my fellow parents that are in the uh, distance learning struggle right now. I did not think that I could loathe elementary school more than I did when I was a student. And it isn't anything that the teacher's done wrong. She's a lovely woman. Um, she's funny. She's working very hard to keep the kids engaged. However, uh, a situation where you have over 27 year olds and an adult trying to talk to them via video chat is an SNL skit. Uh, I don't think we would actually, uh, in our wildest dreams, come up with such an idea and, and think that it was good. There's a reason why children don't FaceTime. Uh, it's because they're fucking terrible at it. And having them FaceTime learning is probably a waste of everyone's time right about now. Um, I felt so bad for my daughter's teacher earlier today. Uh, like I said, she's a wonderful woman. I think she's doing a great job. But just hearing these kids just be children and also having all these flies on the wall, I don't need to be there, right? I, I know that, you know, I can go see what's going on in school if I feel like I have a concern or if I'm, you know, worried about something. I don't need to be a daily participant in the class. And my daughter seems to think that I am one. So like she wants me to co-sign when she doesn't agree with something or if something has happened, she wants to have a coaching session or a gripe session or, you know, my attention right then and there. And I'm in second grade again. And something that today's guest said years ago um, before we'd actually met uh, for a lot of parents going to their children's schools, you know, if they have to go up there for a work hard day or for a conference or something, is returning to the scene of a crime. And I realized that on some level, even though I did pretty well in school and went to great schools, um, and there were a lot of things I really loved about school, that returning to school uh, via my daughter in some ways is for me returning to the scene of a crime because we're returning to time in my life where I started to really fall out of love with education. So I'm so excited to talk to my brother, um, my homeboy that you know as a scholar and pundit and host of the Basketball Wives Reunion. Uh, please give it up for TV's Mark Lamont Hill. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. The man of many Ricky Davis. <laughs> I have interviewed presidents, and yet you started <laughs> with with Jackie and Evelyn. <laughs> oh, listen, listen, because I love you, because I love you, and also that is what your people do to you. Like you, I'm sure if you you're introduced to at somebody's church, they're gonna start about your uh, Black Enterprise television show that you haven't hosted since. Obama was in office, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, stands, out, stands out for them. And the Basketball Wives reunion stands out for me. Uh, thank you for coming on my show, Mark. I'm so happy to see you. I feel like the only way I can actually talk to you is in some sort of professional setting at this point in our lives because we're so busy and now distant. Right. You're on the other side. And it's, it's great to see you blow up like this. I remember when you were still <laughs> doing the, work, the commercials for Boyce Watkins uh, Business School back in the early 2000s. And to see you come up from that to this is like, it's amazing. I've worked really hard. I worked really <laughs> hard. Boys, he saw something in me, you know, like a lot of people, <laughs> they see a resume come in from a Juno email address. They're skeptical, but uh, <laughs> it, took a and it was my reward. Shout out to him. Um, Mark, you were my first uh, fake famous friend, right? <laughs> you the first person who, I knew who was, and I'm like, you're I, you're legitimately famous. It's, it's so much more fun to call you fake famous. And also like you're at that point where it's like a whole lot of people know who you are, but a whole lot of people don't. And so if we were to, if I were to like speak of you as a famous person, like I, if I took for granted that somebody knew who you were, I could look like an asshole. 
you right. know? Conversely, I could take for granted that they don't know you and also look like an asshole. Right. You see what I'm right. saying? I, like, so. That totally makes, totally makes sense. Okay. Smart people, so with that. No, because smart people, a lot of times I meet really smart people, they feel really, they, they assume that they're the only person who knows who I am. Like a lot of times that's the first people say to me like an airport, they'll be like, I, I know no one has ever done this to you before, but I know who you are. And I always, it's like the weirdest compliment. Yeah. So I, why that, I see why that could happen. And so that happens to me a lot. And that makes me feel like, because I'm so fake famous, right? It's just a reminder, Liz. They're like, surely ain't nobody else thought to stop your ass at the Tiggly Wiggly. But here I am, <laughs> acknowledging that I have seen you on something somewhere. You're the girl with the thing to do something. Um, but yeah, no, so you, you've you given me a great, um, you know, to walk in your footsteps. You know, I, I look up to you. You're like an uncle to me. But uh, <laughs> you have helped to model what it's, you know, like, kind of what it is to be a person who is in most ways a regular quote unquote person, you know, who is smart and capable, sure, but like, you're not a singer, you're not a dancer, you know, like you're not doing anything that says, I want your attention. I want people to be, you know, thinking about my private life or to be overly invested in my thoughts, you know? Um, right. So it, it's been fun to, to do this with you, but it, it's also been interesting to go from like seeing the mark on stage, you know, that I admired and then getting to know the man and just seeing how human you are. And I think one thing that's so great about you um, and your public intellectual work is that um, that humanity shows up. So I just wanted to affirm that. I know you were like waiting for the punchline, but there isn't one. I, I, don't usually, <laughs> I don't usually have such nice things to say about you, but I, I want to make sure that I tell you, you are one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, I value our friendship so highly. and. I think so highly of who you are um, and, and what you mean to and for our people. Um, and you have, it's Thursday, so you have a new book out and we're gonna talk all about it. But more importantly, I got some shit I'm going through, so I wanna talk about it. Okay, someone says, uh, what's the drink tonight? Well, I'm drinking um, Crown and Pepsi that oh, I have wow. forgotten to put Crown in, yeah. So it's been one of those days, distance learning, distance learning, second grade. That'll um, do it. That'll do it. So, Mark, I am moving for the first time. So I'm the West Coast? No, I'm not leaving the West Coast. I'm leaving Inglewood. Oh. So, you know, I grew up I grew up in Hyde Park, Chicago. So for folks who don't know, Hyde Park is a uniquely diverse, like Hyde Park is like Sesame Street. You know what I mean? Like in terms of it, it's not. It has a lot of problems. It, it's where the University of Chicago campus is. And that's a very complicated presence in the neighborhood, particularly for people of color, uh, working class people. Um, but even with that, you, you have this unique blend of races and you have a whole lot of black people and you've got a lot of amenities and you have a diversity of class uh, backgrounds too, right? But it's just really like, a, for Chicago to be such a segregated city, it's this really um, race, you know, racially diverse community, right? So that's where I grew up, but it was still largely black. So I was having a black experience. I lived in a building full of black folks, but you know, I, I wasn't meeting white people for the first time when I went to college, like so many folks um, we know right. were. And so I, I've since going to Howard, every place that I've lived has been a historically black community, right? I lived in, you know, the area surrounding Howard. I lived in bed for 12 years. And then I moved here and moved to Inglewood for a year. And Inglewood is extremely suburban, right? Like the mm -hmm. gentrification is starting, but it has the nerve to be, I'm like, okay, so I'm seeing a lot of young white neighbors, but there's no amenities to go with them. So it's like, the only thing that's changing well, that's is, you know, well, what's the point? Like, right, you got all these white people, no Starbucks, no no sushi, no, no massage, you know, no spas, nothing. Oh, we have Starbucks, but like in LA, Starbucks is like, McDonald's or even like Dunkin Donuts, like it's everywhere, you know, like it's everywhere. Um, but like, yeah, but aside from that, it's like, so I'm walking distance to a grocery store and a check cashing spot and a nail shop and a, you know, and, and a beauty supply store, like my basic stuff is there, but also it would be nice to have things to do. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm, I'm grateful to be able to get to a grocery store and a beauty supply, a black owned beauty supply store, but I want to have things to do. So I would say, and my apartment sucks. I ended up renting it like without seeing it in person. Um, so I found a spot. 
I won't say, I'll tell you later where I'm moving to. I'll just say I'm moving to a pretty exclusive part of town. I, I got a good deal. And also the person who listed the apartment listed it in a different community than the one it actually is. So I was thinking it was a more modest part of town and it turned out to be like, a kind of, like, I'm, like this is like moving on up type leap in oh, terms of the I mean, it, it's a it's a condo that I'm renting. Are you, are you feeling guilty about it? Like, are you feeling like 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 you should be in the hood with the people, or are you feeling like you still yes. not gonna get the connection? You want? Are you feeling guilty? Oh, you gotta get over that shit. I'm going through all of it, but the guilt is the thing. I I, I never thought I would do this, so I never I couldn't brace myself for the guilt because I just never thought I would do this. Right. You you got to get over that. Yeah, I had the same problem for like an hour when I moved to Brooklyn. I was like, cause my, my, my I used to live uptown. Then I moved to Brooklyn. I, I, used to, I lived in Brooklyn for a hot second in Bed-Stuy back in like 08. Then I moved uptown. Then I moved to the, the place I'm at now in, in, in Brooklyn. And I felt really guilty for it for like a minute. And then I went down to the common area with the pool table and the massage tables and the Pilates studio. And I, I got over it real quick. There was yeah, a reason yeah. for my daughter's birthday parties at yo house. <laughs> Yo, every I black person, <laughs> right? <laughs> every black person who's in my who's in Brooklyn had their party at my grade. My best friend Doomy had it. You had your. It was like three people had their like either baby showers or kids' birthday parties on the floor. I wouldn't even be there. I don't even the last one. The last one I didn't even go to. <laughs> I was out of town. Down. Just, just, just leave. Just leave a note. <laughs> like and you know, it's funny is that I've been to other black uh, baby showers and events in that same building through some other person, but like, it's like one other person, you know what I mean? And I've been to like four or five other baby showers and stuff. So yeah, but it's the guilt thing. And so it's like, I mean, yes, the connection thing, cause even where you are I'm down, like you're in downtown Brooklyn, like you can get to, you can look out the window and see Dr. J's and see, you know what I'm saying? Like you can right. see your folks, you can exactly. get to them real quick. It's not that I can't get to them quickly here. And like, look, there's nowhere that we're not like, well, there's a lot of places here that we're not, but like, for example, on Rodeo Drive the past few weeks, it looks like Black uh, Beach Week or MTV Spring Break or something. Like, I don't know if kids are just, who are you texting, Mark? We is on the phone. We is on the TV. Uh, Ooh. My apologies. My, my phone kept ringing. I was trying to actually handle it. Okay. So your girlfriend's yeah. here, so. Um. <laughs> Anyway, right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> she might not know I was texting. <laughs> I, know. I, I was texting my account. You know what team I'm on. So, tax, season, tax season was coming up in, in October. And so, you know, I had to get some shit straight, you know, at 10 o'clock. That's Until exactly you. how. Yes, no. That, that's exactly how when my accountant texted me, too. Um, <laughs> it's an alert from PayPal saying you are on slow down. <laughs> anyway, um, so, yeah, so the kill thing is like, so I know I deserve to like look at, and don't get me wrong, like the difference between California and other places, like the hood here is nice, you know, like you see trees, you see grass, like, I mean, it's warm, like it's just, you know, so you go outside, it's not like I don't go outside and see beautiful things. Like I, I live in, I think Inglewood's a nice neighborhood. It's boring to me, that's what it is. Like it moves slow. Mm -hmm. I need bars, I need stuff. Like, it's not that the world is happening right now, but like, I want those things nearby. Um, and when the world does reopen, I want them nearby. But until like, in the meantime, I should say, if home is like where we're gonna like if home is school home is work home is club home is shirt home is everything right now um i need to really enjoy home and i found a place that i really you know like it's a and so it doesn't have like a pool and all that stuff but like it's well we have a pool here we never got to get into it you know like the pool was on my list of like because in la you can have a pool in you like we have a pool here you know like but now i'm like I don't know that pools in the buildings are going to be a fact. You know what I mean? Like if things are shut down for COVID twenty, like that's not the thing I want to. You know what I'm saying? Like base how right. how I'm living. Up, but like, but it has you know a huge walk-in closet and tall. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's but nice. that's all the right shit. That's all the right shit. And, and the thing I I, I learned because I I never paid a lot of attention to home. 
um, before COVID, like, because I was always out or running around when I come home, you know, I don't care about furniture. I don't care about, yeah. you know, I have, like, I do like a basic minimum thing, but like being stuck in my house in Philly, you know, for like six months, I was, you start appreciating shit and, and having, like you said, cause home becomes everything. It becomes the center of everything. And even in the New York, same thing. I live between Philly and New York and the same thing. It's like, I, I want to enjoy home a lot more now because I don't know over the next five years, it might be, a, you say COVID, 20, shit, it might be a whole bunch of COVID. You know what I'm saying? We might spend the next five, and, and we may never go out like we used to. Like people don't really want to go back to offices and work and stuff like that. And so you may end up having to be home a lot more. And if you are, then you got to make sure you enjoy that shit. Right. So don't feel no like, guilt. Go to that, get your little luxury building, get you a nice, okay. Uh, house servant or something. House servant. There's not gonna be no house servant. She's a cleaning service. Um, and <laughs> it's not a luxury building. It's just a. It's just a nice condo building in a nice part of town that just might be like walking distance to the Four Seasons. Like, wow. But it, it's, you came up. I came up. Like, if you saw the juxtaposition, like if I posted the picture of like the outside of my current building and this one, and again, it's not a luxury building. It's just a nice condo, right? Like, I'm not gonna. You know, it's just nice. But if I compare the two of them, like you would, they would give me like a 30 for 30 or something, or this would be like a story, like heartwarming, <laughs> like single mother who aren't, like, who's making the same amount of money, realized that she was tricking away her dough on Fashion Nova and Seamless. And if she spent more money on her apartment, she could actually live there. Plus, I need to be around the time. I need to be around the type of men I'm trying to be with. Like LA dudes are different. Like I just want to say this briefly. Um, they're like, are they super, I mean, black? are there a lot of black ones? I mean, those are when I say dudes, I only am talking about black. You know what I mean? Like other people are just like people. Like we talking about dudes and talking about like black men between the ages of like 25 and 55. 55. I'm sorry, you said what? 55. <laughs> I said 25, <laughs> but I think 20, 25 is like, what's ethical? What's considered ethical? It's all in know, proportion okay. to your age. It's in proportion ahead, to your please. age. Okay. Oh, you want me to continue? Because I was going to say, you know what? Like today, I realized something that fucked me up. So Naima is seven. Um, and as, as you and I have talked many times over the years over whether we want to have more children or not, you know, like because. Yeah we became single parents at a relatively young age. So it's kind of like, okay, when the kids are grown, like we still, you know, we still out here. So it's like, do you start this process all over again? And so today I was thinking, I was like, okay, man, I'm set like name is seven. I'm not giving this like forever. I'm like, okay, here's a window of time in which I'd be willing to be pregnant again after that. You know, we had to figure something else out. Like maybe just not having another child, you know, or adopting an older one. And I'm like, damn, Naima sibling is going to end up being 10 years younger than her. The age difference between Naima and her sibling gonna be the same as uh, me and Naima's stepdad. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's gonna be so awkward. <laughs> so I have to like rethink a lot of things about my off. life. Now. Yeah, you I thought about now, that would be, huh? Yeah, you have to skew up now. You, why don't you try the other side instead of doing like 10, 15 years younger? Try to get like an OG, get somebody who's like, I'm you know. Sure. 15 years younger, Mark. Like, what we're not gonna do is put in a little extra uh, razzle dazzle. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not good at math. I'm good. What well, I'm saying, however old, I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying, try the older side. That might actually be better. And then he'll be ready. I'm, you know, I'm, at I'm age, open. I'm at an age now where I'm ready to have more kids, right? Whereas, like, 10 years ago, I wasn't. And so, like, I'm ready to have more kids. 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 Like, I'm ready to have more that's kind of what happens, unfortunately. Like, if you want a good guy, you got to wait till he's done, you know, running the streets. So what I decided to do, unlike a lot of my peers who just sat on the porch waiting for y'all to be done, it just took me a couple laps too. figure I might as well get to know the block, <laughs> get to know the Ave. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I've been slowed down by COVID. So I'm just going to claim it and say I decided to retire my jersey um, and step out the streets. But uh, since we have you here, we, we might as well talk about something related to children. Um, so homeschool. One, I'm curious to know what your daughter's experience has been like considering um, how much. Are you OK talking about that? 
Yeah, I mean, um, in terms of in terms of like COVID and homeschooling. Yeah, like I'd be curious yeah. to hear about the the older child's perspective on it. Yeah, you know, she's uh, you know, she's sixteen, so you know, it's it's interesting, right? On the one hand, like you lose all social contact because when you're fifth, you know, when this shit, when, when this whole thing stopped in March, it was like sudden, right? So. You know, and, and everyone was terrified by April. And so it was like, don't leave the house, don't do this, don't do this. And so if you're careful and don't want anybody to get COVID, you, you know, a big part of high school is a social network. You lose all of that. So you get to take yeah. your classes, but you don't get to be, hang out with your friends. You don't get the type of stuff you get to do in 11th grade, which is about mm -hmm. you starting to explore your independence. Yeah. Half the class is old enough to drive. You know, a small number got cars. You know what I mean? You know, or just hanging out and exploring, figuring out who you want to date. All that kind of stuff is like part of the, the journey. And I think you miss out on that as far as the actual teaching part goes. You know, it, I don't even like to call it homeschooling because homeschooling has a plan. It has a curriculum, yeah. has a pro. This was just schooling that happened to be at home. Basically, they didn't plan online education. They just took what was in the classroom and, and just moved it. And the more resources you had, the better you could make it work. But a whole bunch of people just got, just got some MacBooks and some Chromes and were just told, you know, make this thing work. And so I, I'm not sure the quality of education uh, was good either. And then the teachers are stuck, right? Because the teachers don't have access to, uh, you know, resources like like uh, child care and stuff like that. So you got people who are teaching at the same time that they try to take care of their kids because for a whole lot right. of people, school is child care. So, you know, all that's going now and everybody, everybody's scrambling. I think this year will be a lot better. But you see, they quickly try to get these kids back into school because people want child care. And quite honestly, parents want to be what they, them kids out the house. So I'm not, gonna I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'm proud of myself. I will say there are certain things like there are a number of things I just don't do. You know, like there's a lot of stuff where I, I've wavered, I've given in, I, I've disappointed myself, but like I've never been with a married man and I'm not gonna send my daughter to school during a pandemic. Like I'm not a perfect woman, you know. <laughs> I, I, I probably go to Target too many times per week. <laughs> you know? uh, like my only social activity, but I, I couldn't imagine sending my daughter to, to school right now. But I also understand that, you know, one, I'm very privileged to not have to, of course. And right. two, that there are parents who are like, look, I could, you know, yeah, I'm here, but I just can't do this. Like, I, I can't function like, um, like this at, at all anymore. I think like, we know that this year is going to be a wash in so many ways in terms of like what kids actually learn, retain, you know, the value of this it just feels like theater, right? Like we're pretending to do school so we could say we did school, you know, checks are still being cut. Um, you know, we're saying we're doing this thing, but the, the quality of the education that most of the kids are gonna be getting uh, via distance learning in this country or via the, you know, new setup for in-person learning, is not gonna be great. What do you think that going into next year, let's just say ideally, um, if for the 21, uh, 20, 2021, 2022 school year, which doesn't even sound like a real thing, um, we're back to in-person learning. What do you think the toll is going to be uh, for all these kids? I mean, in some ways, it'll be considerable, right? Um, for younger kids, you know, learning to read early is important. Um, and the kids who don't read on grade level early um, often struggle for the rest of the time. You learn to read from K to, from kindergarten to third grade. And after you learn to read in those years, you then read to learn. So if you can't read well, you can't pass social studies and science and all this other stuff. So for, for people who are at underprivileged schools or under-resourced schools um, who don't get that instruction, they're going to be struggling. They're going to be behind already. And they're already denied Head Start, early childhood education, other stuff. So it just compounds the gap. On the other end, the other extreme of that is, I think we'll realize how meaningless some of this stuff is, right? You know, people, you know, people at Harvard are like, oh, you know, I can't believe we're paying the same tuition to get online education. And and a whole lot of folk are like, well, shit, your degree's still gonna say Harvard, right? It's not gonna say Harvard online. A lot of what right. we're going for is, is the credential, right? Not the education. And so there are many people who will be just fine. Many of the well-resourced people will be just fine because the education itself is fine but also because it's the social network, it's the social capital of saying, I know this person, I went there. It's the cultural capital of saying, I got this degree or I got this thing that will allow people to get through the world. We'll realize how empty some of this education is that's really a business. So we'll see both extremes, I think. I think there's a, 
everything about this time period is casting a, 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 a tremendous light on how ridiculous so many parts of our lives are, right? Like the media right. industry, every basically every field in which you work, media uh, <laughs> and education. Media education, right. It's all bullshit. I mean, I, I like that, you know, I mean, obviously I like working from home a lot more. I like um, being able to do this stuff. I think we'll never be the same again, right? I mean, we'll, there, I don't think we'll ever get back to normal. Not because you know of any particular commitment by the people to restore our way of life, but because companies are always looking for ways to save money and be efficient. And now it's like, oh wait, we could y'all could do this from from the house and still be efficient. Right. You got it. A whole lot of media companies like, oh wait, we can people will watch TV even if we do it on Skype. We ain't got paid thousand dollars an hour for you to go to a live shot studio to for, for a thirty second interview on on, on MSNBC. Cool. Right. Keep your ass on Skype. Keep your ass on Zoom. And, and yeah. so even the platform we're using for this show, I mean, 10 years ago, we couldn't do this. Now we have a more high, what you're doing right here is a more high quality product than some uh, media outlets have on TV. Yeah. So, you know, the game is going to change because they're going to save money. And, you know, edu higher education is going to look different. High school is going to look different. Jobs are going to look different. And, and it's all going to interest the big companies. I don't know if it's going to do much for the poor, for the poor though. No, I don't think it's going to do uh, much good for the poor at all, one would say. Um, I want to go back to the school thing real quick, because I don't know if you, I guess you caught my, I don't know if you were able to see my intro. Um, but there was a I panel saw, yeah. There was a panel you did for, I would say, maybe Teach for America. Um, this had to have been 2007, mm -hmm. 2008. It was you, Common, John Legend, um, and a brother who is the uh, founder of a principal Ruben in the Bronx. Yeah, Ruben, Ruben Diaz. Diaz. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Yes. And so, Pedro Nogueira was there too. Yep, 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 yep. There you go. And so, like, this is my first time. Uh, see, I think hearing you speak in person. I was relatively new to New York, and that quote uh, stuck out for me. You know, that I was working at an elementary school in Newark at the time, and um, for a lot of parents, returning to a school building is returning to the scene of a crime. Right? It, yeah. It's a place where you were traumatized. It's a place where you were made to feel. Um, perhaps inadequate or just under supported or, you know, disinterested, uh, disenchanted, like all the, the reasons that kids are not into school, you know, are not enthusiastic about school and then become parents who have to, you know, or need to summon some level of enthusiasm or endorsement of school to get their kids through it or else, you know, the cycle continues. And as somebody who was pushed by my, you know, it was never questioned, you know, if I was going to college, it was where I was going to college. You know, I went to an elite public high school and that was you know the journey from when i went to the public good public magnet school that was a feeder for that high school right all like, up to hampton all they the way up hampton. Yeah. anyway um so all of those things lined up for me and i had parents that pushed that but i didn't enjoy you know like on so many levels like i realized i did not enjoy what i enjoyed about school was the cultural connection it's the thing that's been stripped away from the children Right. It was the face to face time. It was seeing, you know, other kids who looked like me and sharing stories and, you know, the human connection that I formed with the teachers and the staff in person, you know, not just um, the the homework that they were sending home. It was it was the love that they poured on us as black children. Right. Is that I was typically taught by people who saw that they had a responsibility to teach black young people, um, particularly in elementary school and, and Howard. And so. We I have had a little bit to drink and smoke. I lost my train of thought. Why was I talking about that? Um, you are returning to the scene of a crime and, and how. Yeah. So it, I would, I'd be curious um, to, to, I'd love to get some advice from you on that. Cause I'll say like, I have to really push myself to not like let on how much I think school sucks to name, you know, and it's not that I think education sucks. It's not that I think her teacher sucks, but it, it it's, the metrics and the things that to get through the Los Angeles Unified School Districts, you know, um, uh, requirements for completion. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, y'all have to waste time on that I don't believe in. Like, this is whack. I think homework is whack. I think, you know, like, help. Yeah, no. I mean, a lot, a lot of it is, you know, and, and there's a difference between schooling and education. And, you know, what your, what your issue is, is with schooling, right? The institution, yeah. the ritual, the processes. Um, not not education. I think, and I think it's okay because I think sometimes we create a narrative for our kids like, oh, I I love that shit. I went to every class. I ain't never cut class. I enjoyed every homework. So we create this bar, then they feel inadequate by comparison. I, I think right. it's okay to be like, yeah, part of this shit sucks, but this is also part of what life is about: is doing some stuff that you don't right. want to do sometimes for different outcomes. But I think it's also important for me as a parent and just as a person, as a learner myself. 
I, I always think, how can we create other opportunities for learning so that they don't associate learning with um, with stress, learning with competition, learning with all the things other than joy and inquiry and stuff like that. So that's why I like to create out of school opportunities. You know what I mean? Uh, have them pursue an interest that they care about. Have them learn in other ways. Have them learn uh, about things that school doesn't teach about. You know, for me, the black bookstore did a lot of that work. For me, my uncle Bobby's house did a lot of that work where I, I could sit, sift through just Ebony and Jet magazines to ask all these questions about these people. You know, like that kind of stuff for me were, were places where I could learn. We, I'm, I grew up pre-internet, you know, obviously. So, you know, we had a, we had a, we had a, 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 these world book encyclopedias uh, on the wall and I would just go through them and pick up the world book and just read them. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know what I mean? I would, I would play puzzles, I would do experiments. You know, and, and, and for other kids, it's other stuff. It's stuff with their bodies. It's, it's stuff with athletics. It's stuff with art and music. You know, I did art and music, more, more music than art because I, I don't have much artistic talent. But I, I, I did all those things um, so that I could, um, so that I could discover other parts of my mind and my spirit. And so I think the best advice I could give is create those things. You don't have to deny that some parts of school are, are dumb or, or, or done for, um, for no clear intrinsic value. Um, but I think you can create other, other things to do to make that not feel as bad. So Sunday is a big day. Okay. It's a big day in the city. Come on, Mark. What's up? I'm old. What's right. Sunday? You are old. So this is your oh! generation. Patty, you said the city. I think you're in LA. LA. That's big for Philly. It's not happening in Philly. I say your city, your city. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. My bad. Yes, of course. I can't wait. That's like, that's like, that's the, this is the first verses. You know, we all say like, there are no winners and losers in this and it's all about celebrating the music. But typically I have a dog in the fight. This time I don't. I mean, I love Miss Patty. I love Miss Gladys. I want to see them both. I, I'm here for all the, all the, all the secret shade, you know, disguised as yeah. praise and love. You know what I mean? But yeah. I actually don't care who wins or loses. I just want to hear great music. I want to hear them tell stories and I want to see them. You know, make sure that for those who uh, are unaware of what we're talking about uh versus which is a series of battles between uh, musicians it started with i think producers and songwriters and then went on to be singers and rappers um two of whom will square off with 10 of their uh biggest hits um song for song and they usually do it in the same format that we're in now you know one person will be at their house and the other person will be at their house and now yep. uh they've been them together uh brandy and monica did one the the biggest one yet which was amazing um a couple weeks ago broke all types of records uh, that one was now, it wasn't my favorite but that was the biggest one that was yeah what was your favorite um Teddy uh, Riley and, question I, I love, did, did, that one would have been that one was really good that one DMX and Snoop was 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 really good too for me. I love Erica and Jill. Those are like the top three for me. It just depends on my mood. But if I had to pick, yeah, I would probably say, uh, I, I would say, I would probably say Erica and Jill. Nah, no, I wouldn't. I say Snoop and DMX. I would say Snoop and DMX because there came a point where, where Jill started playing some some of the songs, adult contemporary music that, you know, what I mean, wasn't really my bag. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and and with Babyface, the technology stuff wasn't wasn't as wasn't as fun. I love all of them. They all go. What'd you say? I didn't. I said the technology was the best part about uh, Teddy Riley, though. That was so funny. That was so. Oh, that made the whole funny. thing. That was uh, But um, I was gonna say I actually didn't watch Snoop and uh and and DMX. I I I, I decided to be principled. Um, like I really don't fuck with Snoop like that. Like I just I I'm bothered mm. by I was already bothered by the fact that like Snoop Doggy Dog is able to transcend you know, bringing two black women on leashes to the MTV awards and nobody was talking BDSM, right? Like this was, these are my bitches on my leashes, right? Um, right. The fact that he like was a pimp, according to him, and was a pimp at a time in his career where it wasn't, this isn't hustle and flow. This isn't, I'm so broke, I'm doing this deplorable thing. It was, I'm, a, I'm on death row. Like I've already made it and I'm still doing this thing. And so I'm like, yeah, so, yeah. okay, but we, there's no toll for disregard, you know, for de degrading black women, right? Like you can continue to store, you don't have to apologize. Used to that. The fact that he was able to, him and 50 spoke the way they did about Oprah and Gail, that broke something in me. 
like that level of like just dogging that first of all like dogging out oprah because you don't like a question that gail asks is crazy like that to me is just so absurd like the level of gaslighting to that like clearly oprah has a problem with black men because look at this question her best friend a journalist asked <laughs> in an interview said, right. like and, and, and with these two men's unique history of misogyny, like like the ways that, that 50 Cent has gone after, you know, black women and, and has certainly said nasty things about black men too, but like there's a clear through line of misogyny that, that defines both of their careers. Like they are mainstream because of misogyny. Like the thing that the white boys who made Snoop and 50 who they are can connect to is not the drugs or the violence, it, it, it's the hatred of women. Right, like it, it's so much a part of the package. So all that to say, for for him to be like, now I'm gonna tell you who hates black men. Uh, that was the that was it for me. I was like, no, that, that's Can't fair. That's a fair critique. I, I actually didn't watch Fabulous's uh, 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 yeah, verses for a similar reason. Um, I I, uh, I think it's a fair critique, and, and that's something. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think you're right. Um, so that left you with um, uh, uh, as your favorite, Brandy Monica. Uh, well, oh, from, Erica and Jill. Jerica, uh, Erica and Jill was like my number. I, I say they were tied. They were entertaining for different reasons. Like it was really nice to watch Erica and Jill love on each other, and it was really awkward and uncomfortable to watch mm -hmm. Brandy love on Monica and Monica. Right. Like, <laughs> Monica, like, you know, like I, I wanted her so badly to just give Brandy a big old hug and just melt, and she would melt for her. I also didn't know Brandy was actually Moesha. And like reads poems and the Frank. Yo, did you see where somebody said they were dressed like Frankie and Grace? Oh my I god! Died. <laughs> I died. It was so good. It was so good. But now, so now we have Patty versus Gladys. I'm so first of all, like, are they doing theirs live together? Are they gonna be like in yeah. Tyler? No, they're in, no Philly. they're in Philly. What? Yes, they're gonna be in Philly at the um, is the film no the old Fillmore building? Yeah, I think it's the Fillmore. They're gonna be F in Philly together in the same place. You know, versus now they like you'd be in the same place so they can really yeah. produce it better uh, and do it on the yeah. versus at versus page. And um, no, nah, they're gonna be that's what I'm saying. They're gonna have they're gonna be full auntie mode. They're gonna kill it. And and you know what? they can't help but sing. So they're not just they, gonna play them hits. Gonna, Patty gonna sing if only you knew. Gladys gonna do it. In neither one of us. It's gonna be crazy. Can you, you eat like liquor? You said what? You gotta get some dark liquor for this. Oh, I've got like I, I have a house full of dark liquor. I'm I'm been ready for this <laughs> all for quarantine. Why are there no men who could do a versus? I've been thinking about this lately. Like two, like I could not think of two men who could do like a vocalist versus two living men. Oh, for sure. I'll tell you who. I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a couple. Now, if we're, are we kind of groups? I'm we can count huh? groups too. I'm trying to think like men who can be match. Boys to men who new can do Okay, new so I've been. Boys to men can't do new edition. Okay. Boys to men. Does your, does your audience understand that you are the world's biggest new edition fan? So, or maybe Naima, Naima is. Naima is. I was about to say. So, so, so I mean, it would be like me saying no. Bobby Brown emoji yesterday on some app where you could draw dolls, and she was making celebrities. She was like, "I should do a boy." I was like, "Oh, which one? Who are you gonna do?" She was like, "Bobby Brown." <laughs> That's so sweet. Uh, Bobby and Usher could do one. Hmm. Bobby Brown oh, and Usher a, could do. One. That's a good one because Usher definitely could do. I mean, Usher deserves one. It's just. Who has who can meet Usher? You know, it's it's not black and Usher is not a man. The person who can meet Usher is not a man. The person who can meet Usher is uh Beyonce. is Mary J. Blige. No, Mary J. Blige. That would be mm -hmm. really good. They got enough hits, the catalog is deep enough. They both got enough I, upbeat and slow drawings. I'm telling you came within two years of each other. That's what I'm I saying. Think it's touch such different parts of your spirit you know like i think that's i mean they not always like they've got their you know club music but like mary don't have as much bedroom stuff i just got a lot of bedroom stuff i mean she has it but it's not her like you know mary yeah, that's like, more, hers more rock bottom. yeah it's like rock bottom or you know i'm i'm, I'm happy again 
Usher got, but, but Mary got the hits. So that's Mary what I'm saying. Mary, Mary can roll off 30 hits, easy. Mary could do verses yeah. with 30 songs. Yeah. Easy. Uh, Someone said 112 and Jagged It. Um, yeah, they did one. Usher yeah, that Chris one was Brown. Cool. Chris Brown can't do battle with nobody but Chris Brown. Right. The, the Usher did that. Like, yo, when they start putting people up, like when somebody said uh, uh, Trey Songs and, uh, and Usher, I'm like, y'all have no respect for Usher, yo. I mean, Chris Brown is dope in terms of his catalog. I'm not a fan, but like he his his, his catalog is strong, but it ain't Usher strong. People underestimate no. what, Usher, uh, what Usher got. Usher has like Usher has been out since 1994. Right. Usher can Usher like for as huge as he is, like yeah, I'm a, a, I'm. Nobody wants to be a soul man. I think that's the thing. Everybody like everybody needs a pop hit. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. Like the dudes are just not making timeless music. Like I not, I not solo, not solo, right? You get people, or you get somebody who gets like a real short run. Like you'll get somebody like a Jaheem who give you like yeah. you know one two great albums, and now he's a, now he's a now he's a mega weirdo, right? And and then you get um, Jaheem, or like is- a, Jaheem. Jaheem is straight mega. What? Okay. Trump. Go yeah. to his IG page. Look I'm at good. his IG Y'all page. Good. I wish you well. No tongues forked against Raheem. <laughs> I can't have no more trolls, Mark. I can't do it. Oh, tr- believe me, I understand. I've, I've had my share. So instead, Stevie Wonder and Smokey. That's interesting. I don't think that's a fair matchup. Because I think. Smokey as songwriter, yes. If, if, yeah. if we put him as songwriters, yes. A, or as singer songwriters, yes. Because Smokey can pull out all, all the great stuff he wrote for Jackson 5, all the great stuff he wrote. For. But if it's just songs, I don't know. Stevie pulls out that pulls out that songs in the key of life. I mean, Stevie can pull out, again, 30, 40. Smokey can pull out 15. But if we get to the songs they wrote, yeah, I yeah. think that would be amazing. I think then it's amazing. I think then it's Is amazing. There that who does... Quincy Jones ever like is there a world in which there's anybody who could do a Quincy Jones versus? Just, just Jesus. Just Jesus. Just it's Jesus like Quincy it. Jones and every other song, not maybe right. Quincy Jones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. By what's left. Right. No, nah, Quincy there's nothing there's no there's no match to Quincy Jones on any level. It's just it's, it's just not he's a different thing. He is a very different thing. Mark, are you still drinking red drink? Uh, I don't drink red drink anymore because I, I red cup. Yes, red drink. No, and the reason is because um, yeah, like your life taking care of you. I'm <laughs> that, and I don't want to die. Um, there you go. You know the red. Drink, I'm trying to cut all that sugar out. I don't need diabetes. I don't need. You know. Also, I can see that the sugar gut coming. You know. Yeah. I, I was and COVID had me drinking way too often. I you know I got COVID in July. And after I got COVID, um, I um, I stopped drinking altogether. You know, d- during the time I was recovering, and and since then, like I never picked it back up, like like the way I was before. Like I'll have a drink here and there, and, but it's almost never liquor. It's usually like wine, and it's usually a small amount. You know what I mean? And you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I like the way I feel. It's not just that I that I, I feel like my body's changing, but I actually I actually like the way I feel. I, feel, I don't feel as heavy. You know what I mean? I don't feel as stressed and stuff like that. Me too. So no That's red good. drink. That's because I smoke a lot of weed. Okay, so before we get out of here um, and before you tell us all about your latest book, there's a quick game that we're gonna play, um, Rapid Fire. I change the name of it every week. Basically, uh, you may remember this from when Baby Girl was a baby girl. Kids, uh, younger kids are very good at waiting until the worst possible moment to ask you a difficult question. So you're trying to take a conference call or get out the door. And they're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Where do babies come from? So I'm going to uh, put 90 seconds on the clock and I'm gonna ask you as many difficult parent uh, questions or difficult questions that a little person would put toward a parent as possible. And let's see how uh, you answer them. Okay, ready? and I gotta answer as succinctly as possible? As succinctly as possible. So let's see as okay. many of them as you get in, in 90 seconds. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Why can't I get my own car? Because you'll die. How? Um, 
seat belts. You're not responsible enough to do other things, like take out the trash or remember to come home on time. And so I worry that you won't fall. Say again. What if I do? You don't. You're not responsible. You remember to be places on time, and you still have a car. Uh, yes. And as soon as you can buy it the way I can, be my own, you can do it. As soon as you can buy your own. You're against capitalism. I am. So you and your community of people can 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 collectively get a car and share it, share alike. Oh, I have money for one. You have money for one? Yeah. Then you can get one. I can have a car. You can have a car. As long as you can afford to pay for it and the insurance, you can have it. I'm 11 years old. Um... As long, if they sell you the car, you got it. Well, they did say they sell me the car. I that? told them that my name was Mark Lamont Hill, and they said I could have it. <laughs> then you're good. I'm fine with that. I want to go to Howard. I want you to dream big. <laughs> I want. <laughs> Is it just not big enough for you? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Are you saying I can't get in? You no, know, I'm saying, look, Harvard, Yale, Hampton. Um, yeah, I see DC. There's a lot of other options. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Mark. That was wonderful. Um, people who didn't get the opportunity to go to Howard always have such lovely things to say about it. So I, <laughs> I can only imagine where you're coming from. I can't relate. Uh, before we get out of here, please tell us about your latest book. Uh, my latest book is called We Still Hear, Pandemic, Policing, uh, Protest, and Possibility. And, and, and it's a book that I wrote. Uh, it's really a collection of conversations I had uh, with a comrade, uh, uh, Frank Barat, a, a French uh, journalist, uh, along with a couple of original essays on abolition and some other things. Um, and really what I'm trying to do is make sense of this moment. I'm trying to figure out uh, what it means to be a Black person who has to make decisions like, do I go out and protest and risk my life or stay home and continue to have my life jeopardized by the state You know, when they beat us and kill us? It's about trying to figure out how in a, a pandemic like COVID, which should be attacking all of us equally, is disproportionately hitting the vulnerable. Um, it's about trying to figure out how we have a march in Minnesota for black, for black folks saying that black lives matter at the same time that a black trans woman is being beaten um at the same night in the same cities um you know do all black lives matter i want to talk about what it means for us to have to look at george floyd's body for eight minutes and 46 seconds on a video and what it means for us to constantly 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 be assaulted visually um by the spectacle of death right what does it mean for you to go on your timeline and have to see a mount arbery kill whether you ask for it or not or that's what it means to be black and vulnerable at this moment i'm trying to figure out how how the richest people in the world are getting richer during COVID, and the rest of us are getting more and more uh, economically vulnerable. But I didn't want to write a book um, that simply pointed to all of the bad things in the world. I didn't want to just talk about the disposability of being in a prison where you have to make hand sanitizer and masks but can't get any for yourself, or a nursing home where you're dying of preventable illness. I wanted to talk about what's possible, what we're protesting for. You know, I wanted to talk about our freedom dreams and I wanted to help follow the tradition of black feminist intellectuals and activists who gave us the most beautiful and rich and ambitious freedom dreams. I wanted to be able to say, let me not just dream of a world where police don't beat us, but let's continue to dream about a world where we don't have policing. And that's not something that I created, that's a tradition that I'm following and that's part of what the movements on the ground are. And in the same way, that we figured out how to give out them $1,200 checks and we figured out how to bail out corporate America and we developed a language around defunding and abolition that the public didn't have before, we can figure out a way, we can figure a way out of this mess and we can figure out a way to make a more fair and more just and more free world. And, and that's what I'm trying to do in this book. And, and that's why the book is called We Still Here because it's about our resilience, it's about our power, um, but it's about the fact that we have to utter that to a world that still wants black people gone that black resilience and black survival um, is an act of resistance, that our existence is our resistance and that we continue to battle for it. So yeah, I, wrote, I put this little book together. It's a short book, uh, Market, and it's something I'm really proud of. I'm, I, was, I was happy to put it together. I wrote half of it with, um, and 
it, it put everything in perspective for me. So people can go and, and, and they can go to bookshop.org, uh, hopefully through Uncle Bobby's, or just go to Uncle Bobby's website and find a way to buy it. That's my bookstore, Uncle B O B B I E S, uh, or they can buy it wherever they get their books. But it's called We Still Here. You know, Mark, when you got sick, um, aside from being terribly worried about you, of course, I, I knew that you would write um, something about this. And I was looking <laughs> for a COVID cornbread and me to be coming out uh, <laughs> sometime this year. I appreciate how quickly you worked through your pain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You have officially thrown down the gauntlet to Michael Eric Dyson. No, <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's right now. No, it's funny because in March I was like, "Yo, watch one of these. Watch somebody come out with a COVID book in the middle of this." And you know, because I was and I was you like, "Who has time to do this?" Wait, you said what? You started coughing, and then you started coughing. coughing. Right. <laughs> when that fever hit 103, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was right my ass up." I was like, I needed, I needed to, uh, I needed to get some ideas out, and I had something to say about the moment. And for me, it wasn't like, yo, let me make some quick money off this or anything like that. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a, I'm writing a, I'm writing a, a straight to paperback book on social. Books. That's what the basketball wives reading is for. Exactly, exactly. I do basketball wives. We can get free. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, just, I had something to say. You know, and and. As I get older, writing has become more and more of my my, my avenue for for um, for critique, but also for helping helping myself even dream about new possibilities. Writing is how I dream, and 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 so I was I was it was dope to write it. It's funny you mentioned Michael Eric Dyson because we, Mike and I talk about it just about every day, and um, we were both writing our books at the same time. He has a wonderful book coming out uh, in December um, called Change Gonna Come. And he's helping us think through race in America and policing and all that stuff. And we're taking different angles, but it was really dope to be sitting there at the same time writing a book with my friend and my mentor, um, and, and thinking through this stuff as we're both stuck in the house. And every day, every morning, calling each other like, "Yo, you heard that? What happened? Yo, you see what so and so did?" Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah, no, the bonds that we've been able to forge with people during. The, I mean, not, I, I know you all had a relationship before, but there's definitely some um, some beautiful stuff that's going on uh, in the midst mm -hmm. of all. This tragedy and chaos for sure. And so, Mark, I I'm glad that you were able to make something uh, beautiful out of this moment. And I look forward to reading your book. Um, I'm grateful that you are here. You, I love you. You love us so much, not just me and Naima, but our people. Um, you, you love us so profoundly and so publicly, except for the time you uh, voted for Jill Stein and single-handedly installed President Trump as uh, single -handedly. the world. I but, am a um, super delegate, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, aside from you being a super delegate and a super predator, um, you're, you're, you're a wonderful human being and you've been a great guest. So thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Um, can you thank give you, everyone- thank you, thank you. Give everyone the URL again for Uncle Bobby's. Um, do If they wanna yeah. order books from Uncle Bobby's, do they order through Bookshop or do they go to straight to Uncle Bobby's? They can go to Uncle Bobby's, that way we can direct them properly, but it, it just go to unclebobbies.com, Uncle B-O-B-B-I-E-S. You can buy online apparel, you can shop for books. Uh, you can do uh, whatever it is you want to do there um, with regard to our apparel, our books, our merchandise, donations, whatever. Um, we're grateful for all the support we've gotten over, over the last couple of years. Um, we, you know, we're one of the largest now black bookstores in the country. And um, I, I'm, it's such a blessing. And it's all based on on the generosity and love of our community. So um, I'm just grateful. But yeah, you go to UncleBobbies.com if you do that. And again, thank you for having me. Yo, thank you for being my friend. Uh, give Naima a hug for me. And um, I can't, I can't wait to talk to you again. Yes, you take care. You be safe, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Um, and exciting news for those who haven't heard: all six members of New Edition now own the copyright to the name New Edition. At one point, only Johnny Gill and Ralph President owned it, and this is in time for the 25th anniversary of the Home Again tour, which is next year. So, I think New Edition. Look. This family has got to be that fist, like they mama <laughs> said. So I think we need a new edition bubble. We got an NBA bubble. It works. Put new edition in a bubble, and we might get a tour next year. So that's all I'm saying. I'll see everyone next week. Thank you, Mark. I'll see you on Sunday watching uh, the Hometown Girls Squall. And everyone have a, a great week. We will see you next time. My guest will be Kiara Pasante Houghton, and we're going to talk about mothering during a movement. Mm.
be well.